This morning I'm speaking on the hidden dangers of fear. And I want to begin by reviewing with you three types of fear. First of all, there's holy fear. This is a reverence for God and awe of God, our Creator, Savior, and Lord. Proverbs 9.10 speaks of this when it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So this is a good fear, a godly fear. Here is Oswald Chambers' famous daily devotional, My Outmost for His Highest. And in it, he writes, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. A second kind of fear is self-preserving fear. This is the God-given instinct to run from danger, avoid an accident, or protect ourselves and those we love. This is another good form of fear. And I'll give a few examples of this in our message coming up. The third kind of fear is slavish fear. These are fears, these are contrary to God's will for us. <clears throat> they enslave us with ridiculous phobias. They set us up for abuse and addiction. And they eat away at our sense of security. This is the wrong kind of fear. Now, in our passage today, 1 Samuel chapters 19 through 22, we find four lessons about slavish fear from David's experience. Here's lesson number one. It's difficult to manage our fears. <clears throat> we start in 1 Samuel 19 verses 9 and 10. An evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the harp, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. Okay, this was self-preserving fear, the God-given instinct to run from danger and protect yourself. There's nothing wrong with this kind of fear. Now we go to verses 11 and 12. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michael let David down through a window and he fled and escaped. Again, this is self-preserving fear. Nothing wrong with it. But in the next chapter, David is going to begin to show slavish fear. Now for us, um, life is a lot like walking a tightrope. And on both sides of the tightrope, you've got fear. If you fall off on this side, you fall into the arms of God. And uh, th this is the, the good holy fear, the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. But if you fall off the tightrope on this side, you fall into slavish fear. It is never God's will. It's always an enslaving thing, and God doesn't want us to be enslaved to, to things and uh, addicted. <clears throat> For the last three years, our son Tommy has been uh, a member of the California Highway Patrol. And when he first started serving, and this was true all three years, uh, he was on the graveyard shift. So he, uh, he, you know, he was on the job all night long, like until dawn. He told me over the phone that um, every night he goes at least 100 miles an hour chasing some speeder. <clears throat> now also, almost every night, you know, in recent months, I've seen on TV these stories of peace officers who shoot somebody they have no business shooting and how the public is, is growing, you know, uh, 
against peace officers and, and that, that kind of thing. So, so I fear, first of all, for Tommy's safety. <clears throat> and then I also fear for the public image that, that he has a, as a peace officer. And so the point is, uh, I, I can testify that um, it's, uh, I very easily slip into slavish fear and it's difficult for me to manage. So how then are we supposed to be good tightrope walkers? Well, you know the obvious things. Be in the word a lot. Cultivate a life of prayer. Live in a spirit of dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's a good one. <clears throat> be afraid of falling into slavish fear. Ironically, one of the best safeguards against slavish fear is to be afraid to fall into that, to be afraid of dishonoring God. That's part of the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. Now, these safeguards I'm talking about are all disciplines. And whenever you talk about disciplines, you know it's not going to be easy. And that's what makes it difficult to manage our fears. Here's a second lesson <clears throat> I find in David's experience. Slavish fear makes us doubt God's promises. We're in chapter 20 now, verses 1 to 3. <laughs> then David fled from Nioth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, what have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to take my life? Never, Jonathan replied. You're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without confiding in me. Why would he hide this from me? It is not so. But David took an oath and said, your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, <clears throat> Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and you live, there is only a step between me and death. Now, this is David's slavish fear. The end of verse 3 was true from a human point of view. So, namely, there is only a step between me and death. So why was it wrong for David to be afraid of this? And my answer is because it contradicted David, God's promise that David would be the next king of Israel. Instead of saying, there's only a step between me and death, David should have said, your father Saul can't possibly kill me now because God has promised that I'll be the next king of Israel. And if your father did kill me, uh, that would overturn God's promise and God always keeps his promises. However, David was not talking that way. Couldn't David remember how God had helped him kill the lion the bear, and Goliath? Not when he was a slave to fear. His slavish fear sank him into doubt. <clears throat> In the early 20th century, there was a famous atheist who was a professor at both Oxford and Cambridge universities in England. His name was C.S. Lewis. When he was a young man, Lewis wrote in a letter to a friend, I believe in no religion. There is absolutely no proof for any of them. And from a philosophical standpoint, Christianity is not even the best. All religions, that is, all mythologies, to give them their proper name, are merely man's inventions. Lewis had a brilliant mind. He knew every reason that intellectuals could come up with for denying that Christianity is true. He also had some painful experiences 
that made it easy for him to be an atheist. His mother died when he was a boy. He was shipped off to a boarding school where the headmaster was cruel and abusive and mentally imbalanced. He endured the terror of trench warfare in World War II. Some of his friends died, and Lewis himself was wounded. And so it was that C.S. Lewis had all the intellectual arguments and all the shattering personal experiences to be a world-class doubter. But God took hold of C.S. Lewis and turned the world-class unbeliever into a world-class believer. Here's a book titled Conversions, and it tells the story of the conversion of lots of the giants in church history, including C.S. Lewis. And the quotation I'm going to read to you now is originally from C.S. Lewis's book, Surprised by Joy, which is the story of his life and his conversion. But here's, in this book, they, they quote it. And uh, he says, you must picture me alone in that room, night after night, feeling the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. Later he would say that he came into the kingdom kicking and screaming. But God blessed C.S. Lewis. He went on to write the book, the series, The Chronicles of Narnia, maybe you've even read that, and also his defense of Christianity, uh, the book Mere Christianity. At the end of the 20th century, Christianity Today magazine came up with a list of the 100 most influential Christians of the whole 20th century. And number one on the list was C.S. Lewis. Wow. <clears throat> and so Lewis dared to give God a chance to overcome his slavish fear of rejection and mockery at the hands of his fellow intellectuals at the universities where he taught, and God blessed him for it. Here is one of the volumes in John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Whether you agree with Calvin or not, <clears throat> uh, this is probably the most famous uh, systematic theology <clears throat> ever written. Here's a little quotation from John Calvin here. So deeply rooted in our hearts is unbelief, so prone are we to it, that while all confess that God is faithful, no man ever believes it without an arduous struggle. Therefore, we need to be constantly on guard against the slavish fear that causes us to doubt God's promises. Now here's the third lesson today. Slavish fear causes us to forget God. In verses 5 through 7 of chapter 20, we read, So David said, and here he is speaking to Jonathan, the son of Saul, Look, tomorrow is the new moon festival, and I am supposed to dine with the king. But let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says, very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that he is determined to harm me. Well, <clears throat> This is David's scheme to protect himself. He doesn't pray about it. He even asks Jonathan to lie to his father, 
by saying that David is off to Bethlehem when that wasn't true? Where is God in David's speech? Nowhere, because he's forgotten about God. David has the opposite attitude from the attitude he had when he faced Goliath. And he said in 1 Samuel 17 to 37 in, to Goliath, the Lord <coughs> who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He didn't say that to Goliath, but about him. <coughs> David should have told Jonathan here in 1 Samuel 20, the Lord who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from your father, Saul. But it seems that David has forgotten all about the Lord. When David went out to fight Goliath, he told the giant, the battle is the Lord's, 1 Samuel 17, 47. But he couldn't say that about this battle with Saul. Instead, he made it his own battle and he left God behind. This is slavish fear. The Lord wasn't in David's mind here. <clears throat> Every uh, fall, Mary and I go to Hume Lake for the annual Pastors and Wives Conference. And years ago, we heard the following story from the speaker who was Howard Hendricks. Now, Howard Hendricks was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. And as he told this story, I you know, copied it down in my notes to make sure I could remember it and so forth. And here's how the story goes. He was there at the seminary in Dallas and he gets this phone call from one of his former students who's now a young pastor. And the student is having all kinds of trouble and he wants Hendricks to help him or give him advice. So Howard Hendricks says to this young man, uh, where, where is your church or where do you live? The guy says, Atlanta, Georgia. Hendricks says, all right then, I'm going to ask a favor of you and before I ask you, I want, I want you to tell me if you will do me this favor. The young pastor says, okay, whatever it is, I'll, I'll do it. Howard Hendricks says, okay, I'm going to call up Charles Stanley, who also lives in Atlanta. He's the pastor of First Baptist Atlanta. And Charles Stanley photo, maybe you recognize him from uh, television. He's got a, he, for years, he's had a ministry on TV. So Hendricks says, I'm gonna call up Charles Stanley and get you an appointment with him. And you gotta go see him. So the young pastor goes in and he meets Charles Stanley and he tells him his issues and so forth. Charles Stanley's first question is, how is your prayer life these days? And the young pastor says, practically non-existent. Stanley replies, then you need to repent of the sin of pride. The young pastor says, explain to me how, how, how does pride come into it? And Stanley says, it is a mark of pride when you think you can do supernatural ministry in your own strength without the help of God. Wow. <clears throat> Forgetting about God. That's what slavish fear causes us to do. And Stanley's advice is good not just for pastors, but for all Christians. We can't really make any impact in this world if we put God on the shelf, forget about him, fight our battles in our own strength, and just try the hardest that we can to do the right thing. Now maybe it's a fear of failure that makes us stumble into that pit, or it could be a fear of what people will think of us if we just surrender to the Lord and rely on him and confess that, that we can't do this in our own strength. But however you slice it, it's slavish fear and it's never God's will for us. <clears throat> now for our fourth and final lesson here today. Slavish fear is a sin that hurts other people. As a sin, 
Slavish fear is something Jesus died for on the cross. He shed his blood to wash this sin away. And it's not a self-contained problem. It inflicts harm on other people. Here's how we see that beginning in chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. David went to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech, the priest, The king charged me with a certain matter and said to me, No one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. Now here again, David tells another lie in verses two and three about how he was on a mission for Saul. Um, And this time he's lying to the priest Ahimelech. David wasn't on any business for Saul. David was running away from Saul. The story continues in verses seven through nine. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg, the Edomite, Saul's head shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a sword or spear here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's business was urgent. There he is lying again. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. Now back in chapter 17, David refused to wear Saul's armor because it was too big for him. But here he takes Goliath's sword, which is even bigger. All he really needed were his five smooth stones and his slingshot, but he's trusting now in a worldly weapon. The story continues as we flip ahead into chapter 22 now, verses 1 and 2. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, They went down to him there. All those who were in distress or debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. These 400 men were looking for a fight and someone to lead it. Saul, as their king, should have made them feel secure, but he made them feel crushed with stress and unfair conditions. Saul was a terrible leader, and he went on to accuse his leaders of committing treason against him. This is in verse 8. Here's Saul speaking to his leaders. Why have you all conspired against me? None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son has incited my servant to lie in wait for me. Saul is paranoid. He thinks the whole world is against him, and neither of Saul's accusations that he makes here is true. Saul, uh, Jonathan, had not conspired against his father, and David had not been lying in wait to kill Saul. Fear can make us distrust the people who love us the most. So here's Saul We kind of expect him to be in slavish fear. But nonetheless, he's he's showing us the principle of slavish uh, fear. Now we read in verses 9 through 12. But Doeg, the Edomite, who was standing with Saul's officials, said, I saw the son of Jesse, that's David, come to Ahimelech at Nob. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions in the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. 
Then the king sent for the priest Ahimelech and his father Saul's family, who were priests at Nob, and they all came to the king. Saul said, Listen now, Ahimelech. Yes, my lord, he answered. Here's the priest Ahimelech. He doesn't have a clue that anything is wrong. We continue. Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me? you and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of God for him so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does this day? Ahimelech answered the king, who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law? See, he's, he's disagreeing with Saul. The king's son in it's your own son-in-law, captain, captain of your bodyguard and highly respected in your household. Was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family. So here, here we get the first inkling that Ahimelech, it's his first inkling, he's learning that David has pulled a fast one on him. And so Ahimelech tells Saul in verse 15, your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. Absolutely true. He, he, did, he didn't know what David was up to on this. Ahimelech had not done anything intentional to hurt Saul, but Saul was about to slaughter him. We read in verses 17 through 19. Then the king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill the priests of the Lord because they too have sided with David. They knew he was fleeing, yet they did not tell me. But the king's officials were not willing to raise a hand to strike the priests of the Lord. The king then ordered Doeg, you turn and strike down the priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod he also put to the sword Nob, the town of the priests, with its men and women, its children and infants, and its cattle, donkeys, and sheep. Wow. Now later, David confessed to the son of the priest Ahimelech that he, David, was responsible for that slaughter that took place that we just read about. This occurs in verses 22 and 3. Then David said to Abiathar, this is the son of the priest Ahimelech who has already been slaughtered. That day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul, I am responsible for the death of your father's whole family. Stay with me, don't be afraid. The man who is seeking your life is seeking mine also. You will be safe with me. So, not only did David's lie lead to the death of the priests, it also put the son of the priest in danger of losing his life. And so it is, the lesson comes back again, that our slavish fear is a sin that hurts other people. Well, our series on David is called Become a person after God's own heart, because that's what the Bible calls David. And today we've learned that being a person after God's own heart means not giving up in our spiritual battle against slavish fear. So then, by way of action steps, here are two things you can do to take positive action against slavish fear. Number one, identify your slavish fear. Now, earlier I said, uh, I shared about my fears for our son Tommy in the highway patrol. It turns out that after three years of serving with the highway patrol, he withdrew. He's no longer in that job. He now has a much safer job, it's a nice job, and it's safe, 
and I don't worry about him in his job anymore. Does that mean that I've conquered my slavish fears? Well, I wish I could say yes, but just last Thursday, our daughter Leslie and her husband Jonathan drove up to Puyallup, Washington, their new home, they have an apartment up there, they have jobs up there. And uh, it was a two-day trip, Thursday and Friday, and I was afraid that they would either have a car accident driving up there or car trouble, and maybe I'd have to go to Oregon to, you know, bail them out or something like that. But no, they made it just fine. So now they're in their apartment. They're soon going to be doing their jobs. Le Jonathan has a manager, management job, but Leslie's job is going to be to walk around neighborhoods, ring doorbells, and take political surveys. Now, you know, <clears throat> that sounds scary. For a young lady all by herself to be ringing strangers' doorbells, who is that inside? So I'm afraid of that. I also admit that I fear that Jonathan could have a recurrence of his cancer that he had uh, a year ago. He's cancer-free now, but... You know, th this is something that I struggle in, in, in my worries about. And so I kind of feel like as long as I'm alive, I'm always going to be wrestling with slavish fear. Now, your slavish fear is probably something, you know, totally different. But, okay, maybe it is you, you, you think that God doesn't love you or that he hasn't really forgiven you, even though you asked him to forgive you with your faith in Jesus Christ, but you're afraid that, oh, I don't know if he really forgave me, or that God is against you, or that you'll never enjoy God's best plan for, for your life. What, whatever your slavish fear is, identify it. And then the second action step is this. Trust God, conquer your slavish fears. Here's a book written by Craig Brian Larson, and in it, he tells a story of Juan Carlos Ortiz. Juan Carlos Ortiz is, you know, something of a famous pastor, and Ortiz tells the story of how he was once talking with a trapeze artist, and the trapeze artist was talking about the net underneath the trapeze, and he says, yeah, it's really there so we don't break our neck. <clears throat> but then he quotes the trapeze artist as follows. The net also keeps us from falling. Imagine there is no net. We would be so nervous that we would be more likely to miss and fall. If there was no net, we would not dare to do some of the things we do. But because there is a net, we dare to make two turns. And once I made three turns, thanks to the net. And then Ortiz uh, made this observation of that. We Christians have security in God. When we are sure in his arms, we dare to attempt big things for God. We dare to be holy. We dare to be obedient. We dare because we know the eternal arms of God <clears throat> will hold us if we fall. Amen. That's our security net against slavish fear. We're going to conclude our worship service this morning <clears throat> coming to the Lord's table and celebrating communion. I, in my message, I think it was point three, I identified slavish fear as a sin. And at communion, we get reminded of the forgiveness of sins and how it was accomplished for us by Jesus, namely by his death on the cross. When he let his body be nailed to the wooden cross and when he allowed his blood to flow, 
as it were, it, it flows down and falls on our sins and washes them all away. And that's what the two elements in communion represent. The bread symbolizes the body of Jesus and the cup symbolizes the blood of Christ that was shed for our forgiveness. So this morning, as you partake of the bread and as you drink from the cup, let it be a, a testimony to yourself and to others to here today that yes, I need Jesus. I'm depending on Jesus. I'm not going through my life alone uh, on my own power and credit and so forth, but it, it's all about Jesus.